Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, Tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkie listeners. Did you know we're still trying to get to 100,000 downloads by January 1st, 2022? While you're listening to this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, rate us, and leave some feedback so others can find us as well. All right, sit down, settle in. We have Vinny Tortorich back for round two. Today, we talk about his book, Fitness Confidential, his new movie, and no, it's not called Fat Three, how diet culture messes up our bodies, how to fuel ourselves for working out, how to start moving our bodies more, Vinny's thoughts on pre-workout and exercise supplements, when is it too much exercise, Vinny gets personal and we talk about addiction, he tells us why people don't meet their goals, in his opinion. Clarissa hits him with some rapid fire questions, and we ask him if there are any special considerations for men. Welcome, Vinny. Thank you so much for being here with us again today, Vinny. I was just telling Clarissa, I've been listening to your book on Audible because I felt so bad after we had you on back earlier this year, and you kept saying, well, I talk about this in the book. I talk about this in the book. So I got it on Audible, and lo and behold, you narrate it on Audible and it's quite the ride. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that experience making the Audible book? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The book, I never wanted to write the book. I just didn't. I felt there were too many fitness books out there and the whole thing. And and my buddy, Dean Laurie, who helped me put the book together and I put him on the cover as a co-writer, he kept saying to me, I don't think you understand. You have a book in you. Now, who is Dean Laurie? Dean Laurie is, he's a Hollywood writer, producer. He's written some of the funniest stuff you've ever seen. He's one of the writer producers for like Arrested Development, the sitcom, A Wife and Kids, movies like Major Pain, stuff that really makes you laugh. And he was a close friend, still not was, is still a very close friend of mine. And every Friday night, Dean and I would get together for dinner. And, you know, we would have these long conversations because we would have a drink. And he said, man, I wish you would write some of this stuff down. And I would say every Friday, the world doesn't need another fitness book, especially mine, because they won't like what I have to say, because I would tell the truth. Well, after like hearing this for 30 times, and me giving pretty much the same response, one Friday night, he said, I'm not going to ask you to write a book anymore. I'm going to ask you to read a book. And I went, okay, I like to read. What do you got? He goes, uh, Anthony Bourdain wrote a book called Kitchen Confidential. And I said, yeah, but you know, I like to eat. I'm just not big into cooking. He goes, read the book. I said, no, I'm not going to read that crap. And he says, I'll tell you what, if you read the book, I guarantee I'll promise never to ask you to write another book. So lo and behold, I went home and I was getting ready to order it. Serena had the book. She had never read it either. It was just sitting there. We have a lot of books. So I sat down and started reading Kitchen Confidential at around 10 o'clock, half drunk, by the way. At one o'clock in the morning, I put it down. The next morning, I picked it up again. And at three o'clock that day, I called Dean and I said, I'm writing a book because I knew what he wanted me to do. I figured it out. And if anyone has read Kitchen Confidential and read Fitness Confidential, they follow the same sort of edict as far as how, you know, it's not just about the food industry, it talks about that, but it talks about Anthony Bourdain's life. We did that in this book. We talk about my life. And then it, you know, it rolls into this bizarre fitness world. And then it meanders again, it meanders three times. The word keto hadn't been around. We, we haven't invented the word keto yet. It was ketogenic back then. I kept it out of my book on person on purpose. I just called it no sugars, no grains. I ended up getting the trademark in SNG, No Sugars, No Grains, from the government. The book came out. I decided to self-publish the book. But as you can tell, it doesn't look like a self-published book because 
I didn't just go to some vanity press and get them to press me out 2,000 copies. I hired an editor that actually worked at Simon & Schuster on the side. I hired an actual company to print the book to be printed in, you know, for book form, you know, printed copy for every type of, you know, formatted for whether you're going to read it on your computer or on the phone or on a tablet. Remember, they used to have like nooks and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, It's formatted for everything. Just like every other major book out there, I paid a lot of money to do all this because I believed in me and I believed in this project. I was told that, and this is why, Clarissa, you're going to end up reading it today when you hear this. So hang on. I was told that if your book somehow makes it in the top 10,000 on Amazon, meaning 10,000 is the top 10,000 books being sold in the world by the biggest bookseller, you've made it. So that morning when it came out, self-published book, it was somewhere around 350,000th in the world. And a couple of hours later, Dean Laurie called me because I was out working, I was out training people. And he goes, your book made it to the top 150,000 books. being so, I mean, that's pretty cool. I finished working with my next client and there was messages again. Dean said, you're not going to believe this, but in the past hour, you broke the 100,000 mark. So your book is now selling. He goes, this is unbelievable. And I said, is it really? Because he goes, no, celebrities don't get this. Your book is selling like crazy. I said, well, Dean, do you think we can make it down to the 10th hour? He goes, listen, at the way it's going right now, you'll make it down probably to 50,000 before you go to bed tonight, but it'll stay there for five minutes and then that's it. That's all you'll get. I said, okay. I didn't hear from Dean for a couple of hours. He must have had meetings. He must have been writing or doing something. And he called me and he said, this is like two or three in the afternoon. He goes, your book is in the top 30,000 being sold by Amazon. And I said, Dean, we might make 10,000 by tonight. And he goes, no, that's not going to happen. Long story short, when we went to bed that night, my book was the number two book being sold in a category and it was in the top 2,000 overall. I was beating out Tina Fey, who came out with a book the same day. So it was a book about the Queen of England, me, and Tina Fey. We have a screenshot of that somewhere because there's no way in hell this is ever going to be done again. Now, what happens in Amazon is once you do something like that, once you're up there, they start recommending to everyone else. Amazon doesn't care who you are, right? Mm -hmm. It's a meritocracy. They're telling everyone else, hey, if you like the book you just read, you might also like this, correct? Well, it kept selling like that and selling like that and selling like that. We stayed in the top 100 for a month. We stayed in the top two or 300 for another month. We stayed below the top 10,000 for six or eight months. The book just kept selling and selling. Now you asked about, you're listening to the Audible. Yes. I actually added to the, as you can tell, I don't have a problem telling stories. (laughs) talking. <laughs> my, my favorite part is I never really know if it's part of the book or not. Or, and then you're like, oh, now back to the book. Or for those of you who got it on this, you just got this extra information that I decided to leave out of the written version of it. So that's and, and how by I the way, <laughs> We didn't know this, but people who read the book started telling everyone online, oh my God, he put so much more in the Audible. Well, as it turns out, I was told that if you sell 500 Audible copies of anything, call yourself a success. We were up for Audible Book of the Year, read by an author. I was in that category with none other than Dolly Parton. Everything that happened around, I'm at a black tie event in New York because I'm up for Audible Book of the Year. We're 10 years out and that book still sells like hotcakes. Yeah, Not like it did in that first six months, mind you, nothing stays there, but it finds new audiences. It just keeps finding audiences. The, The Audible book keeps finding audiences. And it's mainly why I get the podcast for free and be autonomous and not have to worry about sponsorship. And, you know, I can say what I want because the world is still buying Fitness Confidential, which is kind of nutty. I'm sorry I took that in. It's an indulgence on my part, but I haven't told that story probably in the better part of six years, seven years. No, I think it's great because I really did feel bad after when we got together and, and I hadn't read your book and you kept saying it's in the book. And so I was like, you know what, I've got to get on this. And I purchased it a while ago and I've just finally, you know, you got to go down the line and you were up and here we are. And 
it's just like having you in my head several times a day, you know, whatever, several days a week. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want that, Vinny? That's what I'm saying. My it's wife like, one. Um, <laughs> so what can you tell us about film three? Because we've been dying yeah. to know. Fat three, film three. We want to know. It's not fat three. This is a whole <laughs> departure from fat a documentary and fat a documentary two. Okay. It's completely different. In those movies, we introduce you to why we got fat as a world as a nation, but as a world, you know, here's the history, here's the history of veganism and where it started and how it started and why it started. Here's the history of dextrinization and cornflakes. And, you know, we took, we started in the 1860s and brought you right up to date. And fat too was basically, okay, now we've warmed you up with that. Here's more of the interviews that you didn't get to see in fat one. Here's an extended, I wanted people to realize I didn't just cut something together to make it look a certain way. I just took these same scientists and, and experts and just let them, I just fleshed it out a bit. And some people think Fat 2 is actually better than Fat, the original Fat of Documentary. The third movie, I'm going after this fake meat industry and this whole fake, you know, meatless Mondays and why we're trying to get rid of meat. It makes zero sense. Everything that's being said on the other side of the equation is a lie. And we have proof of that. Unfortunately for vegans, I know they think that they're saving things with a face. I can't remember. Are either of you vegans? No. Okay, good. And Clarissa, you're from Canada, right? Yeah, Anne Murray. Right. right. Hot chicks from Canada, man. Nothing <laughs> like it. Anyway, I digress. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm showing that, you know, nothing is free in this world. You can't crack land without killing, right? And I have some pretty incredible footage. I invited three, five, five of the top vegans from around the world, mm -hmm. you know, like the leaders, Walter Willett, Michael Grieger, McDougal, just to mention three, invited them on and everyone, because I wasn't trying to show a one-sided thing. I wanted to show both sides. I don't have a dog in this fight. I really don't. I wanted to hear their reason for this fake meat industry and how manufacturing something that's going to pollute the air is somehow better than eating something that's natural. I wanted to hear their side of it. I mm -hmm. wasn't going to joke or tease or anything. I don't do that. In my mo you, You've seen my movies. Mm -hmm. They're serious movies, right? I've never seen anything like it. You know, they all just categorically turned me down. Okay. You don't want to come in. I can't get you guys to come in. I'll just have to tell the rest of the story as best I can. I don't think the world is actually ready for what I'm getting ready to put out. I'm pretty sure I'll be canceled. I'm close to being canceled already. I'm pretty sure that Twitter is going to get rid of me. Fine. You win. If you think you win, you win. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be kicked off of all social media when the movie comes out because I'm pulling no punches at all. I'm just going all in. Yeah, Do we have a release we like date? <laughs> yeah, release date. Yeah. No, it's a soft date. I'm pushing to have pre-sales going by Thanksgiving or thereabouts. And I want to start showing it to people before the first of the year. So around Christmas time. So it's a Christmas movie. Bring the Perfect. family. I would not watch it with my kids. If okay. you were upset when Bambi died, or was it Bambi's mother? Who Bambi's, died? Mom. Bambi's mother. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you don't want to watch this. Yeah, well, we really want to dive in to all your fitness knowledge, specifically because A, you work with clients with no sugar, no grains, but we also just really want to find out for those individuals that we work with who are getting started on this journey, can you just speak a little bit about how diet culture hurts people and maybe how you would suggest someone just getting started on this journey, what they should do, what are the first steps they should take? You know, diet culture starts hurting people way back when. But by the time I'm finding people, they've done everything 30 times. Does that make sense? Yeah. How talented am I that I can look at this and talk to you about diet culture at the same time? Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, no, diet culture, just to give an example, people come to me and they'll say, well, you know, even though I'm doing low carb and SNG, I can still only have X amount of calories per day, right? Well, whenever people start talking about calories, I go right back to realizing that they're talking about not just calories, but calorie in, calorie out, because that's mm -hmm. all they've ever known, right? And the other problem is, is diet culture makes people think 
that, you know, you can lose 10 pounds in 10 days, you know, and if you stop losing 10 pounds in 10 days after a while, it's not their fault, it's your fault. As a matter of fact, how you say Weight Watchers counts on that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, hey, you screwed up. Okay, we'll let you try again. And then you try again, right? And as long as you keep paying them, they'll let you keep trying again. Does that sound right to you? Does that sound like something that's good? So am I answering the question? Or am I working around it in a weird way? No, I think you're hitting on the right points for sure, because we see the same thing when people come to us and it's, you know, food addiction is their problem. They've already tried all the diets and those diets haven't worked and we don't focus on the calories either. And I think too, right, diet culture and sometimes even athletic culture can hide some of these other problems, but I think it gets started in this messaging. It's socially acceptable. Right. And then there's this message of like, oh, just work out harder. Oh, you have to run, you know, like how often do you see those infographics where it's like a cheeseburger on one side and it says how many calories it is. And then it tells you on the other side, like how long you have to run on the treadmill or something or how many jumping jacks you have to do in order to like work off the same amount of calories. Yeah. Like as I tell everyone, and this is a good way to let people realize that calorie in, calorie out doesn't work. When you think of a calorie, you're talking about a unit of energy. So, okay, so that's number one. Calories is nothing more than a measurement of energy. It's a unit of energy. So what you're basically saying is you can run your car out of gas. You can get rid of all of the energy in your car and somehow the car will keep going. How does that work? And you'll say, well, Ben, if you stop eating, you just live on your body fat. Yeah, but guess what? We have something called hormones and our hormones dictate everything, including the release of that fat for energy. And mm -hmm. if we stop giving ourselves that, it will tell us that, hey, well, I need to start storing this up, right? So you'll screw yourself up that way. There's 20 different ways to screw yourself when it comes to losing weight. And playing the calorie in calorie out game is the number one way of screwing yourself up. So what do you suggest? Like if I'm an SNG, which I, I am, <laughs> what should I eat before a workout? What should I eat during a workout? What should I eat after a workout or an athletic event? Like how do you help the athletes that you work with or the, or the folks that you train? Like how do you help them fuel their before, during, after activity? Fueling before and during and after an event. Okay. Is it an event or a workout? Because they're both very different. Well, let's, let's just start with workout. Just work out. Yeah, just work out. Okay. If you're fat adapted, meaning your hormones are working for you, that's all fat adapted means that you have your hormones working for you. That means that you're living on a low carb, high fat diet. Your body can switch between the fat you eat and the fat on your body because you're not starving. Your body doesn't think you're starving. It's using ketones for energy. Hell, you can wake up in the morning if you want to. I know for a fact, my wife goes out every morning. She's an ultra runner. She's turning 60 in a few weeks. And she'll go out for a 10, 15 mile run in the morning on nothing more than coffee with a little cream in it. So that's proof right there that she's not living on the calories she consumed that morning because she barely had any calories. And to run that many miles would obviously take more calories. So she's running off of her, her body fat. Right. Okay. Will she run better if she ate some eggs or bacon or something before she went out? No, we've done that test. It's no different for her. I, on the other hand, I can do the same thing. I don't like to. I like to have a little something on my stomach an hour or so before I go out and do anything. I just do. I don't know why. Have I done the experiment? Can I do it the other way? Am I just as successful? Yes. I just choose not to. I'll have anywhere from three to six eggs cooked in butter and or three or four eggs and some bacon. Or if there's any meat left from the night before, I'll just eat it all up and then go work out. And then afterwards, usually I don't have any post workout. Again, bro science would dictate, hey, you got a half an hour window, you got to eat all this crap. I might go two, three, four hours before I eat anything after a workout. Right before this podcast, you can tell my face is still a little flush. I was on my spinner for an hour and 10 minutes. And then I just hopped off of that. My roar is right next to it. I'm pointing to these things in the room. <laughs> and I just got on my rowing machine and went for another 35 minutes. And that put me at what an hour and 45 minutes. And all I did was um, brush my hair back, put on a dry hat and a dry shirt. And here we are. I haven't eaten anything. 
I did pour some coffee, but there's no cream or anything in it. I don't think I've eaten. Let's see. It is 530 here. I haven't eaten anything, period, since the six eggs I had at about nine this morning, which is about two or three hours after I woke up. So do you need it? No. Does the industry dictate it? Yes. And that's a problem. They tell you, you need this before you work out. Obviously, they tell you that. They're trying to sell a product. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And they tell you, you need a post-workout. And they even tell you, you need it within a half an hour. It's some crazy window they talk about. There's never been a study done to prove that there's any window where your body synthesizes more protein. Studies never been done. YouTube is full of jackasses telling people that. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense. Yeah. So then what do you suggest if, you know, somebody's just getting started with exercise, whatever, maybe they're brand new to NSNG or whatever, should they get fat adapted first and then add the exercise or? If they're brand new to exercise, meaning like you're 30 years old, you haven't done anything since the half ass PE class you did in junior high, then I would suggest If you're going to start eating low carb, start eating right, start eating more meat, give yourself a couple of two or three weeks of just settling into that, right? Listen, you've been screwing up for a lot of years. Just settle into something. And once you get that, once you start feeling energy, you get through that that keto flu they talk about and everything else, and you'll start feeling energetic. You'll start feeling like you don't want to be on the couch playing some game with your phone or whatever people do. You'll feel like, I think I might just want to go outside for a walk. Just do that. Don't put on special running shoes. Don't go shopping at Lululemon. Don't do any of this crazy stuff. Just walk outside and just go for a walk. Try it on for size. Mm-hmm. Go do something. You might go, you know, I used to love bowling in high school. Might, go bowling. You might, oh, I, you know, you watch the Olympics. Oh, I used to be pretty good at archery. Go pull your bow and your arrows out and just go out in the yard and move. It doesn't have to be. I'm going to the gym and I'm going to join a Pilates class twice a week. and I'm going to do yoga three times a week. And man, I'm going to run a marathon. Don't put all that. Don't don't put that pressure on yourself. Get out and start moving. You might have a dog that's become lazy. You guys can get in shape together, right? If that keeps up on the weekends, maybe, oh, there's a heartbreak hill five miles from my house. Go out there. Dust off your old trainers, as the Brits call them, your old running shoes. Go out there and just walk up. See how high you get that first week. Mess around. Just mess around and let something happen. You might have an old plastic kayak that's been sitting in the shed. You might need a cheap ass paddle. Oh, yeah, I stopped doing it because the paddle broke. Go down to your local store. That's, you know, Dick Sporting. Go get a paddle. Don't make an excuse. You bought that damn thing. It's a piece of plastic. It's going to end up in landfill. Use it. Use it. Don't let it be in vain. There's so many things people have told me. It's like, oh, you mentioned this on your show and that on your show. And I realized I had an old kayak in the garage. And boy, I went and did that. Just go do it. Just do things. And then that might get you going, wow, you know, I really enjoyed bowling last week, but my back was a little weird because I wasn't used to that. You might start stretching and you might go to a Pilates class or a yoga class. It could be that simple. Yeah. So how do you differentiate your programming for different age groups? So say we have listeners who are in their fifties and then listeners maybe who are in their thirties. How do you determine what's probably better? Should they be focusing on cardio? Should they be focusing on weights? Interesting question. You know, everyone should focus on cardio. I say that everyone should try to work up to seven hours of cardio a week. And you always, Jesus Christ, that's an hour a day. No, it could be an hour and a half, three and a half days a week. You know, it it doesn't have to be an hour a day, right? But people say, that's a lot. I used to take three aerobic classes a week. That was only three hours. Guess what? You were fooling yourself. If you want to have longevity, you have to move. Our bodies were not meant to be sedentary. And the easiest thing to do, it's cheaper than getting a gym membership. You could go on Facebook Marketplace and some of these other, you know, Angie's List. I don't know, wherever you could buy stuff eBay, you could buy a spinner. I'm pointing to the one I have right over here. You could buy a spinner for little or nothing. They might sell brand new for five or 600 bucks. You might get it for 150 bucks or 90 bucks and a guy might deliver it. You can get something where you could just start right away. So I think aerobics is the place for anyone to start, whether they're 30 or 60. But we have a little something called sarcopenia, 
And most people think he played right field for the A's. The sarcopenia <laughs> is muscle wasting as we get older. Mm -hmm. And it starts happening around your 30th or 35th birthday. And we'll start losing a pound of muscle per year mm -hmm. until, you know, in your 80s, you're, if you do the math, you're half the muscle mass that you were at 30. Not good. Wow. I'm beating that. I'm beating it with a stick. Uh, you might notice there's a rack behind me, weightlifting yeah. rack. And I use that rack to its fullest. I, I still do squats way lighter than I used to, but I still do. I do lunges. I do deadlift, bench press, pull-ups. All I have is a bar and dumbbells, and I can do every exercise I need to do to keep my body from, you know, so I'm not even slowing down sarcopenia. I'm keeping it at bay because this is my job. This is all I care about, right? So I'm keeping it at bay, and you can continue to keep it at bay throughout your whole life. Now, at some point, there's going to be a, a downward spiral. You know, it's like a 5% here, 5% there. But it's not what it would have been. You know, I look at my brother, who's one year older than me, and he doesn't exercise, you know, and he does a manual labor oh. job. So he's pretty good. But there are things happening. It's just a fact of life. So in the same vein of this, then, you know, and I kind of anticipate, I think I know what your answer might be, but we want to hear Vinny say it anyway. What are your thoughts on sugar-free pre-workouts and the diet pills and the detoxes and the caffeine and the energy drinks, like you were saying, you were alluding to earlier, like the bro science and people just kind of wanting to sell a product. I mean, what do you think about for the, the NSNG folks? And if they were to say, what about this sugar-free pre-workout? What about this? Whatever. I see your answers on Twitter, but <laughs> for anybody who doesn't follow you, <laughs> can you share? For our yeah, listeners? it's not pretty. My Twitter is not pretty. I've been trying to get canceled for so long. Everyone gets canceled <laughs> except me. There's not one that I would agree with. Pre-workouts, what's a pre? I don't even know what that is. I mean, they're going to give you a bunch of sugar, a bunch of some kind of stimulant. You want a pre-workout, drink some water, drink some coffee. You know, that's a pre-workout. That's it. I can't think of anything else pre-workout. If you're going out and it's really hot, you want to take an electrolyte. Mm -hmm. But you're not taking it as a pre-workout. You're not taking it as a pseudo-ergogenic you're taking it to replace what you're about to lose in about three seconds, right? That's different. But there is no pre-workout, post-workout. It's just all BS. And I don't care if it's sugar-free or whatever. It's all stimulant. It's all crap. I don't know if you know this, but in, we're taping this on August 26th. Yes. Five bodybuilders have died this month. Whoa. Really? Right? These guys are taking such crazy stuff now. And these are the people that the bro science guys follow. Five this month, wow. dying in their sleep. One guy died right before, right after competition. They're taking it to such a level now. Bodybuilding, female bodybuilder died in her sleep, 26 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a healthy lifestyle. And these are the people you see on Instagram and everywhere else. And these are the same people that they're on Instagram. And then, you know, everybody wants to look like them. They'll go take Trimbalone and all this crap. And next thing you know, they're dead. You know, they're dead. It's crazy what's going on out there. And it all starts with a pre-workout, a post-workout, take this, take that. Hey, you could take these peptides. You could, And it all starts off really innocent, right? Mm -hmm. But it goes into drug addiction really fast, really fast. And I've been in this industry. I'm 59 years old. I walked into a gym when I was eight. So if you do the math, that's 51 years. I've been watching this for 51 years. It's not where this is heading. And by the way, since I'm talking about it, you guys out there with the HRT, you know what HRTs are? Yes. Hormone replacement therapy. Hormone yeah. mm -hmm. replacement yeah. therapy. You think you're doing yourself favors? Those people I have, yeah, I get it. You can be 65 and look like you did when you were 35. The problem is that doesn't keep up. You're going to harden your arteries. You're going to thicken your blood. You're going to cause cardiac. There's so many things going on. You never hear about that. Mm -hmm. You just never hear about it. You could do this by eating red meat. You could do it by eating eggs. You could do it by having dairy. You can do it by getting in a gym with those things in your system and getting in shape, right? You could do this. Anyone can do it. It's not that difficult. And by the way, the one thing I've, I left out of that little soliloquy, rest. If you get the proper amount of rest, you can do it all. So your you're results, doing the your, work. Yeah, your results may vary, but I mean, it's pretty damn close. So then how with the clients you work with, how do you determine what is an adequate amount of protein for them to be consuming a day per meal? Because, you know, we're in a pretty 
protein obsessed. Yeah, yeah. The bro science right guys now. will say, dude, you need one pound, one, one gram of protein per pound of body weight, bro ski. You need 1.5 grams. Of, I love how they, they go with grams on one end and pounds on the other end. What a bunch of jackasses. You need basically somewhere between, I always tell people you need 6.6 .6 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass. And people go, wow, 0.6. I said, like, yeah, it's really a half a gram. But if I say 0.6, it sounds like I thought about it. I say 0.6, but it's really about a half a gram. And by the way, you can fudge both ways on that, right? You're right. We are protein obsessed and we don't need as much protein as we think. We can get what we need if you're just eating eggs and meat and bacon and, you know, the good stuff. And you're going to get it. You're going to get all of the amino acids you need. You know, an egg has just about every amino acid in it that you need. Now, there's some supplementation you can do. You know, people like taking EAAs and and BCAAs. Do you guys know what that is? You, you're dietitian. Branch, branch chain amino acids. I don't know what EAA is. So. Essential, essential amino acids. Oh, okay. So probably even more important than a branch chain. And you're taking more valine and you're taking more, you know, I can't think of the other two or three, but it's not cysteine. There's a few. And if you take those, they may help you recover. But, you know, science is just out on that. But some of that stuff may help, you know, a little. But as I always say, if it's not being blocked by the UCI or the IOC, that's the two governing bodies for international mm -hmm. sports. The IOC is the International Olympic Committee. If they're not banning it, it ain't helping you. <laughs> Bottom line. <laughs> Performance <laughs> enhancing. Good to know. <laughs> you know bro, take this and you're not going to believe. You gotta, it's like, if that worked, the IOC would be all over it. Whenever I tell that to people, they go, why not think of that? It's like, because you're stupid. I'm smart. That's the difference. Come on. Yeah. You know, but that, that's the truth. If the IOC is letting it go, then it ain't doing anything for you. Bottom yeah. line. By the oh. way, coffee, I don't know if you know this, coffee is banned by the IOC. You can have, if they really wanted to get you and they've never gotten anyone on the caffeine thing, if you have more than one cup of coffee has about 325 milligrams of caffeine, but it washes through your system pretty fast. If they catch you with like the equivalent of 600 milligrams, of they can take your metal away. Whoa. Wow. And the reason being is, I guess it started in the 80s, was the coffee enemas. What oh, athletes geez. realized was, hey, you know, if I drink too much coffee, the adenosine from coffee is an ergogenic, but you don't get enough adenosine from a cup of coffee. So that's why they said, okay, everyone in the world drinks coffee. We can't just take coffee out. So they said, look, if people have just a normal amount of, of adenosine in their system, okay, that's fine. But if they have this really elevated amount that you can only get, and folks, if this sounds gross to you, turn this off and then turn it back on about, go two minutes ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what they would do is they would inject coffee, you know, they would squirt it up their butt and hold it like an enema. Mm -hmm. And the longer you hold it in your intestine, the more chance your blood, you know, it reaches the blood barrier and you mm -hmm. get a crazy amount into your bloodstream by doing that. And then you hold it, hold it, hold it. You're right next to the toilet. And when you can't hold it anymore, you just blast it out, right? And some people would squirt, do two or three squirts like that. And they would over caffeinate themselves. It can be very dangerous, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, caffeine is good to a level, but, mm -hmm. and that's why they had to ban it because, yeah. you know, people were screwing up. Athletes will find every which way to try to kill themselves. Yeah, which totally brings me to my next question as far as you were earlier, you were saying, you know, shoot for seven hours at some point, right? Seven hours of cardio or, or movement of some kind. And because something happens, right? There's almost like this switch that can happen and it can become addictive. I mean, I've worked with people who were addicted to coffee enemas. That's why, like when you started talking about it, I was like, oh, that reminded me of those, those folks. But, you know, so how do we know, like when it's, just being an athlete or somebody who works out, like, how do you determine, like, or how would we know, like it's crossed the line and now maybe it's like exercise bulimia or it's like, it's becoming dangerous for this person to be working out as hard as they are or doing these events that they're doing, going as long as they're going. Several things. And, and by the way, I have a keen eye for it because again, I've been in the gym since I walked into a gym when I was eight. And my original coach, uh, Joe Bonadonna, who's no longer with us, he was the guy mainly, he's the reason, you'll read about him in the book pretty soon, if not already. Yep, yep, I've heard about him. Um, yep. Joe was a steroid user and never allowed me to use him. He was the reason I've never used him. 
I saw what happened to him. They eventually killed him. He, he was dead at 69. But Joe told me something around my 11th or 12th birthday. I was built better than I'm built today back then. And he said, never become a narcissist. And I said, Joe, what's a narcissist? He says, it's a person that start every conversation with I and ended with me. And I said, okay, got it. And then I became a narcissist. You start seeing changes in people. They come in the gym, they, you know, they, they want to get in shape and they start getting in shape and they start feeling empowered. You know, they might've been the nerd of the school or they might've been the fat chick or they might be, and they become something, right? And for the first time in their life, they're being recognized as something other than what they were. And it feels good. So they want to do what I call feeling gooder. So they continue on. They start looking for ways. They don't want the compliments to stop, right? And you'll start seeing it. They'll start doing crazy things. And they'll, and they'll say things like, yeah, I just want to take six weeks of steroids just to see what it looks like. Or I'm just going to diet down just for a couple of weeks because I want to get really ripped just to see what I get a picture and just to see what it looks like. They're already into their addiction. They're mm -hmm. already there. The person that, you know, like I tell people, you should get seven hours of aerobics a week right? That's 365 days a year. If you tell people to get 365 days of aerobics a year, I always say if you land somewhere around 300, you did a great job. If you land at 290, you still did a great job. The exercise fanatic will start missing vacation and family time and, and everything else. And, you know, maybe your whole family liked watching a certain TV show on Sunday, but you're in the basement exercising or running or I was good friends with uh, you guys are too young to remember the Barbie twins, Shane and Sia Barbie. And they wrote a great book about they were exercise bulimics and they would go eat and do stuff in Hollywood and then go out to the stairs in Santa Monica, the famous Santa Monica stairs, and just go up and down the stairs. These are two glamorous women who they were one of two times where Playboy had to go back into a second, had to reprint a second edition in the same month when they were on the cover and they would be glamorous and you're out at dinner with them at the nicest restaurant. And then at two o'clock in the morning, they're going up and down the stairs in Santa Monica, not looking so glamorous. That's when you know you have a problem, right? I've seen it. I've seen it over and over and over again. I, I've lived it with people. I can't tell you the number of times I've been at restaurants and in Hollywood, man, so glad I'm not there anymore. When they left the table, there were two things they were going to do, either throw up or do coke. And that was that. Did I answer that question or did I? Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. I think you did because I think we work in the field of addiction and there is this very real thing called addiction interaction disorder. So it's one disease, many outlets. And so people often go from, you know, like they'll get bariatric surgery. And so now they can't eat the volumes of food. So now it's alcohol, you know, and then they get off the alcohol and maybe now it's exercise. You know, it's, it's just like, it just, it's like playing whack-a-mole and it just jumps, 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 jumps. And we just really want to highlight that, you know, we have to be careful that we can become addicted to the endorphins and the other thing, you know, the neurochemicals that are being released. Like you said, you walk into the gym and you feel empowered for the first time. And we have a disease of more, which means, oh, a little bit felt good. What would seven days of three hours a day feel like? Absolutely. Yeah. And as I, I say all the time, we've lost a fitness middle class. You know, people are either 400 pounds or they mm -hmm. are ripped to shreds on Instagram. There's no in between. There's no, I guess the dad bod, they're the only guys that are holding on to the in between, but they're barely hanging on. They're getting heavier and heavier. But yeah, you know, 70% of the country now is morbidly obese. It's a new study. And uh, so you're either there or you're ripped to shit mm -hmm. on Instagram. There is no in between, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm trying to bring back the middle class of health. And it's tough. It's really tough. So what would you say is one of the number one reasons you see individuals stop fitness routines and not meet their goals? Yeah, that's hard to say. It's really hard to say. You know, I can sit here and give you a bullshit answer, but it might be 20% right. You know, mm -hmm. people who go into it for the wrong reasons or, you know, they, they do that thing where they, you know, we see it in ultra, you know, Chris, my friend, Chris Kostman, who runs one of the biggest groups of ultra races of all time. Chris talks about it all the time. We've seen people that were nowhere. And the next thing you know, they've done enough working out to be in an ultra race, meaning a 24 hour nonstop bicycle or running race. And then you'll see them everywhere for like a year or so. And then they're gone again. They're back mm -hmm. on a couch and you'll say, Hey, what happened to that girl, uh, uh, Clarissa? It's like, Oh man, have you seen her lately? Whew. She's like sitting on a couch and it looks like a a jug of Haagen-Dazs is growing out of her left hand and a spoon is growing out of her right hand. And, you know, 
you hear these stories over and over and over, you know, where someone they'll do it, do it, do it, do it and then, then they're gone, right? And it's not just an ultra sports, you see it at the gym, you'll see, you know, if you go to a gym in your community, you'll see someone come in and they're lumbering around on the uh, stair machine. And next thing you know, they're there every day sweating their ass off. Next thing you know, they're wearing brand new fitness clothes, because they've lost weight, and they're feeling good about themselves. And now they're working out like a montage scene from Rocky Two. And then the next thing you know, you see them in a restaurant a year later, you've forgotten about it. It's like, isn't that the chick that used to be? At? Oh, my God, she put on weight. It becomes an all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And if someone was there to give them a, hey, hey, maybe you should just cut it back a notch here, J just crack it back. As I always say on my own podcast, start slowly and then slow down. I really mean that. You know, I really mean it. And the tortoise always wins over the hair. It took me almost 60 years to figure that out, but it, it's true. Right. Small steps still get us to where we're going. So maybe it's easier to answer this question then. What qualities or characteristics do you see or a special something, right, in somebody that you're training or, or maybe you're observing in the gym or out running or something along those lines? Like, what are those special characteristics or qualities that someone has in them that you know, like you see them and you're like, yeah, that person has goals, they're going to meet them they have no quit in them, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, what do you look for? I've been fooled my entire life. I had to be honest with you. You know, there are people that I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. And then there's other people that, that's why I always say the ones that just kind of meander in like they got lost at the mall. Yeah. And, <laughs> and later on, the, you know, they end up doing better. It's anybody's guess, Molly. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen people gung-ho get on the bike and, you know, they want to be, you know, come ride with me back when I used to do ultra cycling events and man, they're all in and they're buying new equipment and they have nicer shit than I got. And I, I was sponsored and I'm like looking at it going. And then next thing you know, they're back on the couch and you see other people who just meandered in and they stick with it. There is no rhyme or reason. The human condition is a crazy thing. And <laughs> the one thing I figured out is that you can't figure it out. So can we do some rapid fire like questions with you? I was hoping you would. By the yeah. way, I know you guys sent me all the questions ahead of time. Guess who didn't look at them? That would be you. That's me. <laughs> because it's no fun if you look at them ahead of time. <laughs> like, so, Christ, I just oh, screw it. I'm not looking yeah, at Yeah, I'll see you ladies later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so morning versus evening workouts. For me or just in general? Uh, you're in asking, general. Okay. Obviously, you're going to have more energy in the morning. Tests have shown uh, 10 o'clock being the optimal time based on a seven o'clock wake up. I don't know if that has anything to do with any rhythm in your body, but coaches know this. Uh, professional athletes, they try to work out somewhere between nine and 10 in the morning. But I like the evening workout. The problem with it is there's two problems. Number one, the energy is not the same. Number two, when you're done, you got too much energy and you don't want to fall asleep and not getting sleep. So I would have to go with the morning workout. I had to talk myself into that answer. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that. Lightweights versus heavyweights. Again, it depends. And this answer is not going to be a rapid fire answer. I'm sorry. You, you asked me something that's open a can of worms. <laughs> Under the definition of work, let's say that this bottle weighed 10 pounds, right? So if I move this bottle 10 pounds from here to here, back to here, I've now moved 10 pounds. If I do that 10 times, I've now effectively moved 100 pounds, okay? Is that better than me putting 20 pounds in my hand and moving it five times, which will get me to the same amount of work? See, the definition of work is where we have the problem. So mm -hmm. whether it becomes light or heavy isn't the issue. Now we're looking at mass times distance times time, right? So... I don't really care if this is 10 pounds or 20 pounds when I work out with people. As a matter of fact, older people, I would tend to use lighter weight because they already have tendonitis, whether they want to or not, right? Mm -hmm. I have it now. I, I have arthritis all over my body from all the football and mountain biking, what have you, rock climbing. So I would rather use a lighter weight, a lighter weight get the same amount of work in, right? Mass times distance, but I'm going to add time in. So if I did, let's go back to what you said. By the way, for your audience, my degree is, is in exercise physiology, so I geek out on this stuff a little bit. So we have our 10-pound weight, right? If I did 10 of these really fast and it took me 10 seconds, that's not as good as moving 100 pounds and taking 20 seconds or 30 seconds or 40 seconds, right? Now you're doing something. So 
The mass is the same. The distance is the same. The amount of weight we move is the same. We're just taking more time to do it. That's going to be your best. I like that. Does that, did I explain that in a way that's succinct right. so and coherent? It's so slow. So it's about like the amount of time it takes you to lift it, the amount of time it takes you to come back down right. versus the quick movement. Yeah. the quick. And I'll tell you one more thing, and, and this is getting in the weeds a bit, but eccentric contraction, we're stronger with an eccentric contraction, 40% stronger as a matter of fact, than we are in concentric contraction. Do you know what that means? Is Not eccentric me. coming down? When the muscle is straining and lengthening, that's eccentric. So uh, you can see- Give us a flex. Okay, so we're going to take my right arm, right? So you look at my right arm, right? Okay, let's assume that there's some kind of weight in my hand that's pulling against me, right? So, all right, so concentric is when you come in like that. You see how the muscle is bunching up? Yeah. It's getting smaller (laughs) and smaller and smaller, and the muscle is flexing. But since I have something that's pulling my arm back, when you go back this way, you're 40% stronger with an eccentric. This is concentric, closing it down. You notice how the muscle is going out again, it's lengthening, but it's still under pressure. That's eccentric. I'll give you the best example of this. Uh, Pull-ups. So let's say you cannot do a pull-up, but you want to learn how to do a pull-up. This is for your audience. So this is a practical use. So you can't do one pull-up, right? Right. So you get a chair or like a stepping stool or whatever, and you get your chin above the bar. So now your chin is above the bar and you kind of kick the chair out, right? Or move your feet from the chair. Now you're holding your weight in a static position, right? That's really good. Now, if you let it down slowly, you're getting eccentric contraction on your biceps. You're getting, well, your shoulders are going concentric, but you're getting eccentric contraction on all of your latissimus dorsi muscles and your rhomboids and everything else opening up, right? So if you keep, and then you climb back in your chair and pull up again and then go down again, if you keep doing that, eventually you'll build up enough muscle fiber to be able to then pull yourself up too. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Great and, tip. and the same yeah. with the push up, where if you start in the up position and fight your way down, if you can't do one, just fight down. And when you get to the bottom, just get yourself up and then do another one. And if you do that enough times, you know, and you keep fighting on the way down, eccentric contract, you're opening up the muscles on your chest, you're opening up the muscles on your tricep, right? Mm-hmm. And then eventually you'll be able to contract them in the opposite direction. It, it works like magic. It really is magic, it's body magic. It's kind of neat. No, that's, that's really so great because I feel like, yeah, like I'm one of those people, I'm probably like in the middle, like I go hiking and I like, I'm active, but I don't work out Benny, but like something like that makes sense, right? Like I'm going to be more likely to try to learn how to do 10 push ups by doing something like that than trying to do 10 push ups and feeling like I'm flailing and <laughs> I'm never going to get you, uh, do, So you hike up and down hills? Yeah, the mountains. Yeah. I live okay. in Montana. Got to, oh. got to get out there. <laughs> Love Montana. That's right. I wanted to marry you and move to Montana, but you were already married. I'm already married. You are too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dang it. I could get rid of mine. What about you? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> We've got young children. Yeah, mine High school sweethearts. Yeah. I know. That's the best kind because they don't know about anything else in life. I know, <laughs> right? It's so good. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I would have to give away half of all my shit and yeah. Yeah. become <laughs> fond of it. <laughs> so... For you, let's say you took a couple of months off where, you know, you were just walking or maybe doing gym stuff, or maybe you were still like, I'll give you a a great example. Let's say you were going to the gym and you were climbing just on a treadmill, like on the uh, trek climber, Stairmaster, right? So you're like, man, I'm doing a treadmaster for, you know, an hour, you know, every day, five days a week. And then all of a sudden you go hiking and then the next day your quads are like, you know, tight. And you're just like, why is that? I've been working out that whole time. When you're coming down on the hike, you have to kind of catch yourself every time. That's eccentric contraction on your quadriceps. Uh They're lengthening and flexing because if you don't slow yourself down, you'll start running downhill. So you're actually breaking yourself every time you take a step downhill. And if you're not used to that, then you'll feel the pain in your your quads the next day. Mm -hmm. You ever have that? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Downhill is the worst. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But that's why, because we don't go downhill enough in life. We walk flat or we walk, you know, whatever. But that's what that is. That's Mm -hmm. eccentric contraction that's now working against you. Nice. Okay. What about supersets versus isolated? I like isolated. Supersets should be saved for 
sparingly. It's kind of a, a bodybuilding thing. You know, most people don't know what they're doing with supersets. So isolated exercise, it's not even a question. Isolation is better if you want to isolate a muscle, if you want to build a muscle. There's nothing wrong with supersets. It's just most people don't know what they're doing. And some people confuse supersetting with uh, staggered sets. Do you know the difference? No, please explain. Let's go back to the arm again. Okay. <laughs> so if you're doing curls, that works your bicep. If you're doing some kind of push, that works your tricep. So you could do curls. And when you're doing curls, you, your biceps have to lengthen by about one third, you know, to allow you to come in like this. So that muscle, so that muscle is relaxing the whole time while this muscle is working. So while you're resting this muscle, you can now do a tricep. That's called staggered sets. You're working a completely different body part, okay. a, a part that's antagonistic to what you're working in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah. That actually will help more people than a, uh, a stagger a set super. will help more than a superset. And, but most people should stay away from that because most people don't know what they're doing. Fair. What do you think about high intensity interval training? There's a place for it if you're in a sport where you need to do it. But even at that, people don't, I, again, you got to have a coach that knows what he's doing. When someone tells me, yeah, I do hit five days a week, I always say to them, no, no you're not. You're not. No, no, really. I go to a hit class. It's like, no, you can't. And the example I like to give is take someone like Lance Armstrong. We know two things about Lance. Genetically, he's a freak. He's a genetic freak. And he was a drug abuser. He took performance enhancing drugs. This is a fact. Even a guy who's a genetic freak who took performance enhancing drugs never did high intensity interval training more than once a week when he was training. While everyone else is riding the spring classics, all the GC guys are back home with their coaches, sleeping with supermodels and rock stars and whatever they're doing, getting massages and just building up miles, right? And then they'll do high, and once they have 12, 15 weeks of that in their body, then once a week, they might start doing a more of a hit workout within a longer workout, right? But that's not for the faint at heart. And that's a guy on drugs and a super freak exerciser, you know, athlete. So if the mere mortal thinks they're going to go to Hillary's class five times a week and they call her Hillary because she's so hard and they're going to, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Okay. okay. Those are my rapid fire questions. Molly, do you want to? Molly, do you have anything? <laughs> I don't know any rapid fire questions, but Marissa, how but did I do? You did really well. I'm very, I'm very impressed. Okay. A plus gold star. I really think it's important that we would be remiss if we didn't ask about special considerations for men before we let you go. And so while we predominantly end up working with women, and I think you said the same thing happens to you, we were just wondering what unique issues do you find that men face when it comes to body image and how that plays out with this bodybuilding or, you know, CrossFit or I don't know, any of the things, the diet culture, the athletic culture question that I don't really have a good answer for. You know, I think men have some of the same insecurities that women have, less likely to admit it. Hell, we won't even ask for directions. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, so it's a little difficult. And I have friends who are gay, and they talk about dating in the gay community. And it's like, God, if you have an extra ounce of body fat, you know, you consider the fat so and this and, that and the whole thing is a lot. You know, so I, I think in a gay community that, you know, I, from what I hear, you know, it's, it's a lot more prized. I think women allow men to get away with more in the heterosexual community. But then you have guys that, you know, I, I do these consults, people can call me up and do so it's kind of the only time I'm talking to regular people. And a lot of the guys will just confide in me. I'll go, yeah, I haven't dated in three years, five years, four years. And I go, not one date. No, my wife left me. I haven't started dating. And I'll say why it's like, I can't stand the way I look with my shirt off. Why would anyone else want it? Why no woman wants to see that? And man, it makes me a little upset, you know, that they feel that way. But that's usually why they're calling me. And I hope that the, you know, I hope they get what they want as far as getting in shape and all things. So I, I do think men do think and worry about it. I'm just not sure. You know, I just know what guys tell me. You know, I just want to get laid again. You know, guys are honest about that. How do I get laid? It's like, I don't know. You got a Ferrari? You got a bag of blow? I don't know. Um, oh, no. I, I, you're asking me? 
with the same woman for 15 years. I, I don't know. I don't know how it works. I think it's, I think it's re- just refreshing though, to know that, you know, men are reaching out, they are confiding in somebody and that, you know, you're willing to talk to them about it and recognize that it's probably more common than we even know, you know, and that they're not alone. Yeah. Like I said, you know, straight guys won't talk about it. Gay guys will. And I'm not sure why they're willing to talk about it more. Maybe they're just more open. Or sure. at least the, the gay guys I know just more open. But yeah, I think, like I said, most guys won't even ask for directions. Why, why do you think they're, they're going to talk about this? It's too intimate. Yeah. I think they suffer more with eating disorders and in silence on their own, right? I don't know. I know bulimia and anorexia kind of started ending up in the male population. Um, that was generally just a chick thing for forever. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here, Vinny. I, like I said, definitely breath of fresh air to get the chance to talk to you after eight months since we last spoke to yeah. you. And uh, it's just been nice to get a new perspective on some, some things. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.